Good morning, and welcome to the morning after a program presented by the Eagleton Institute of Politics at Rutgers in New Brunswick. I'm John Weingart, I'm Associate Director of the Institute. Uh, this is a program we began at Eagleton in uh, this primary season of the year 2000. Since then, politics has just gotten stranger every year, but we've done this. It has been an in-person event for many years where people would come to Eagleton um, and a room full of people would discuss what happened in the day, previous day's election and what its implications were for both politics and policy. Our thinking of putting together these sessions was that most of the people attracted to it are political junkies of one sort or another and would be seeking out other people to discuss the election with and we could help provide a, a, a venue for that. We had these sessions in person until two things happened. First, we were able to live stream the events so that um, people could watch them who, and who were not and participate in them who were not actually physically in New Brunswick. And then the pandemic came. So I hope that Eagleton will return to having these in person or in some kind of hybrid form in the future. But for today, we're happy that you're all here to discuss yesterday's primary and the 2023 legislative session and uh, policies in New Jersey, public policies as we go on. With us as a panel this morning are two legislators, Senator Steve Orojo and Assemblywoman, excuse me, Assemblywoman Sadir Jaffer and three journalists, Terrence McDonald from the New Jersey Monitor Colleen O'Day, who will be joining us shortly. She's looking for a parking space, I think, um, from New Jersey Spotlight, and uh, Joey Fox from New Jersey Globe. Uh, so to get us started, I wanted to ask the two legislators if you could talk some about what your thinking was yesterday as, um, as people who follow politics and as people who are in the legislature and have both chosen to uh, have this be your final term in the legislature. Senator, you wanna go first? Sure. Well, John, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Absolutely. All right. I thank you, and uh, and I appreciate all the panelists being on, and the Assemblywoman. I I was going to mention the same thing. The Assemblywoman and I are both not on were not on the ballot last night, so uh, or yesterday. So it, interesting enough, we probably had a little bit of a different feel of what it used to be for over the past you know couple of years for us, uh, you know, running, but. Um, you know, last night was kind of interesting. I was obviously I'm up in the northwest corner of New Jersey, uh, District 24, which is all of Sussex, um, you know, Warren County and, and some Morris County. And quite frankly, one of the interesting things that we had up here was a, a commissioner race. You know, we had a commissioner race um, that uh, a young individual by the name of Jack DeGroote, he ran and it was interesting. His he didn't run against anything. He ran for a position. No negative advertising, no negative that I could see at all. And he won against a two-time incumbent and against another um, uh, an, another uh, uh, candidate as well. And he won by a very, very large margin. Um, did a lot of work, just local retail politics, going to different groups, speaking on a very positive message. And um, he did extremely well. I was very, very proud to see that that had happened. Like I said, he didn't run, per se, against anything, no negative stuff. He ran, uh, you know, for what he thought he could do for, you know, for the county. So it uh, looks like um, Suns County is probably going to have a, a, another a young commissioner who did, did very well. Um, the thing out here, the turnout out here, so and obviously it's, it's all um, predicated on the number of you know, contested races you had. And we did have contested races, mostly on the Republican side in Sussex County. We didn't have much of contested races on, on the Democrat side. And, and the turnout, you know, showed that. Like on, you know, on the Republican side, it was about, you know, a little bit more, about 22 to 23 percent. And on the Democrat side, it was about, the, you know, the 12 percent because they had a lot less. We had a contested commissioner race. We had contested assembly races. And on the Democrat side, there was no con uh, uh, uncontested uh, Senate and uncontested Assembly uh, race. So 
it, it was it was just interesting, obviously, to see that. And from my perspective, I mean, the assembly woman has been able to serve in the majority. Uh, I've never. This is my 16th year in the legislature. I've never served in a majority in the legislature. Um, and the importance of that, and obviously that's what we're going to continue to focus on, um, you know, going forward into the general election is, is the idea of picking up those seats to be in the majority because, you know, obviously that's significant some of the influence and control that most people don't even, don't even realize. I will say that some of the things obviously I think – um, I'm interested to see what the assemblywoman would say, but I think some of the key things that will be talked about during this general election cycle is going to be obviously affordability. That's always an issue. Uh, we could talk about the plans that the Senate Republican budget members just put out uh, yesterday. Uh, obviously, parental rights um, is going to be a, you know a big issue uh, with respect to uh, education. The energy master plan, or uh, some is a very expensive. Uh, and some people would say very uh, impractical. And then the other, the school funding is always an issue because you had over uh, almost one third of the school districts that continue to lose a lot of uh, funding. So any, I, I think those are probably going to be the main key, um, you know, talking points. We still have to get through the budget, and we see some of the things that have been happening right there. Um, but John, that's what I see you know, coming out yesterday. And I think the, one of the real interesting points as I, as I, when I started was the issue of uh, this young, terrific candidate who didn't, like I said, he ran for something, not against something, and he did extremely well. Thank you for that. And, and that's a good uh, lead into to calling Assemblywoman uh, Jaffer. I think the panel was put together deliberately to pick uh, legislators who were not seeking to run for another term, both for two reasons, really. One, to get your perspective as other people are putting their heart and soul and money into desperately trying to get a seat in the legislature and you're voluntarily giving one up. Um, and also, you don't have an opponent who would feel bad that we were giving unequal time to you as opposed to them. So, <laughs> uh, but someone, what's your perspective on the election this year? Sure. Uh, so I think those of us who are active in politics or political animals, uh, as, as we're sometimes called, pay attention to the primary. Um, and, you know, this really gauges, it's, it's really a gauge of how many contested races we had, because that's what's going to motivate people to go out and vote generally. Although my advice to voters out there is usually vote in every election that you're eligible for, because it's a habit, it's a muscle that you want to build. Um, and it's a good opportunity to get to know who the candidates are on the ballot, whether they're contested or not uh, in their primaries. And uh, it's something that you should take your children to. It's something that you should post on social media about. I think all of us on this call are probably really passionate just about civic engagement and people making sure that people do participate and that they get their voices heard. And we know that those people who vote in the primary are then much more likely to vote in the general as well. Um, we saw in you know several races, uh, again, it's unless there's an open seat, it's a question of whether a challenger can really uh, make inroads against an incumbent. And though we did see that happen at the local level and at the county level, uh, has, has been mentioned, uh, and that's where I started in politics, running for local government, being on the township committee, serving as mayor. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of possibility there uh, in terms of getting to know your neighbors on a very granular granular level and letting them know who you are and perhaps uh, overcoming the advantage that someone who has party support and sits on the party line might have at the county and local level. Uh, but, you know, researchers who talk about these things also mention that at the legislative level, uh, that hasn't happened. Someone who's a challenger has not won against uh, an incumbent or someone who's being endorsed by their party in, in quite some time. And so I think that that is something to consider, something to think about what are the opportunities for fresh voices to get in? Um, you know, as somebody who has worked to build up a party uh, in Montgomery Township, a town that used to be all Republican, and then I was the first Democrat, we got a few more elected, I served as mayor. I know the work that goes into party building, uh, but, you know, I think we all want to balance that out with the opportunity for new voices to get in and for fresh perspectives to be represented. Um, you know, from where I sit and the people that I talk to, I think that people are generally 
concerned about their safety and well-being. Um, I think, thankfully, in New Jersey, we have some of the strongest gun safety measures in the country, but things are, there's constantly, you know, people being killed in schools and malls, uh, and people want to feel safe and know that their children are safe. Um, another issue that is very important to myself and many people that I know um, is reproductive rights, something that is challenged and un- endangered in much of our country. Uh, but thankfully, in New Jersey, we are working to continue to enshrine those rights uh, for your your own health, well-being and self-determination as a woman. So, you know, those are some of the issues that I hear people talking about a lot. And, uh, you know, state government is is super important. Um, I try to get that point across to everyone that I talk to. And I would say, you know, just as a final note that I have the utmost respect for anyone who stands up to run for office. It takes a lot out of you. It takes a lot out of your family and everyone you know, and it is a public service. And so I'm sure, you know, some people won, some people didn't, but I just want to commend everyone who took that step because from personal experience, I know that the, the sacrifice that that takes and our democracy is only as strong as those people who step up to serve. Well, thank you for that. Senator Rowe is finishing his fifth term in the Senate. This is your first in the assembly. So what can you say a little bit about what went into your deciding not to run for a second term? Yeah, I think that, um, as I mentioned, it's public service takes a lot out of everyone. It takes a lot of out of your family. We don't have that many women with young children in the legislature in New Jersey or anywhere else for that matter, because it's very, very difficult to balance those things out. Um, I have a career. I teach at Princeton University. Um, and I think also being a minority woman candidate, the types of attacks that I face um, are, are tough to contend with and especially to put your family through and put a young child through. So, you know, I, I, um, was talking to my husband and I was saying, you know, one of my problems is that I feel this intense responsibility to solve, you know, all the problems out there. But all of us would say, and and everyone who I spoke to about my decision, that family comes first and our responsibility to our children, uh, we have to make sure that we're able to, to really take care of them because they're only young ones and that's the most important job any one of us can have. That's true. Um, I think Colleen O'Day is having trouble connecting at this point. Um, so let me start to call on uh, journalists. I'll start with uh, Terrence McDonald, who is um, the uh, with the New Jersey Monitor, which has been a New, a New Jersey uh, uh, watchdog publication since 2021. There's an yep. online publication. And yep. uh, Terrence is the editor after being a New Jersey reporter for other publications for a long time. So welcome, and what's your take on the 2023 election so far? Hey, thanks for having me. Um, I guess my take is how sort of dismal the turnout is so far. I mean, it looks like it's not the worst in history, but it's pretty bad. Um, There's probably a lot of reasons. I think maybe the chief reason is that there are so few races that are contested. Almost everybody was running unopposed. I live in the um, 34th district, so the Democrat who was running for state senator was did not have a challenger, and there was not even a Republican who filed to run. Um, all the assembly people, the two Republicans and the two Democrats were running unopposed. So there wasn't a ton of campaigning outside of some lawn signs. So, you know, for the average person who's not super keyed into this stuff like I am, you just sort of don't even know that there's an election happening. And even when you look at like the neighboring districts, when I go out like and run errands or go to the store or visit friends who live nearby, I'm looking at the 36th and the what at the 29th, the 35th, they're, they're all they're all the same, right? There's there's nobody running opposed there. So there's not a ton of campaigning there either. So it's just sort of like you can just live a normal life and not have any idea that there's an election coming. Um and the one that's nearby in the 27th district, there was a contested primary between Senator Cody and Senator Nia Gill. I mean, even there, I think for like just the average person, it's sort of hard to convince them to get out and vote because these are two liberal Democrats who people like, and they're running against each other. And I think it's sort of hard to convince a democratic voter that you should come, that it's really important to come vote for one rather than the other, because I I don't think it really would have changed anyone's lives um, no matter what the outcome was. Um, So, yeah, I think that's sort of the chief thing that I'm looking at is, is 
how dismal turnout is and and how I how responsible I think uncontested primaries are for that. Um, and maybe if you know every single legislative district had a real race, then there'd mm-hmm. be campaign signs everywhere. Candidates would be out on the streets because they'd actually be fighting to, to fighting for every vote. And it's just sort of invisible. That's interesting. Well, thank you. Um, Colleen, I don't sure. Uh, Colleen O'Day, are you, you there you are. Uh, Colleen O'Day has been a reporter in New Jersey for a long time, uh, primarily with the Morristown Daily Record and has been with uh, New Jersey Spotlight though since 2011. And uh, is primary primary coverer of election news among other news. Welcome. Thank you. I'm glad I made it. Um, my internet crapped out at just the right time, but uh, <laughs> I got it back on. So I really have no idea what anyone else said. I hope I'm not repeating folks. Um, I, uh, I, and thank you for having me for the, I'm not sure how many of these I've done, but I, I think it's always fun. Um, there's There was literally one surprise, but like a tiny surprise for me. I mean, literally everybody who, save for, I think, um, Nick DeSilva in the fourth, um, who was, who got a party line w- one election. Um, in DeSilva's case, it was a split party line. So he had the the line in Gloucester and um, Del Borello had it in uh, Atlantic and Camden. Um the other f- fun thing there, of course, is that uh, George Norcross, who apparently has not, um, in fact, retired from trying to influence elections, uh, spent a bunch of money trying to defeat Del Borello and oops, lost that one. Uh, Norcross has not had a really good um, track record in recent years. Um, so, but, but save that, everybody who who got a party line got reelected um, incumbents got reelected. The only incumbent who lost was Mia Gill. And that's just because she ran against um, Dick Cody. She was the only incumbent who chose to, um, who was redistricting, redistricted into um, a, a district with a sitting incumbent who chose to run. So, you know, God bless her for trying. Um, and so she's the only one who lost um, but otherwise, every incumbent won. Um, it t- the, the folks who had more money won. I mean, it was just it was everything that we know about these elections. Um, you know, and to, to Terrence's point, when I went in to vote and I voted early, um, there, there was literally no one. There was no one at the state level. There was no one at the county level. And there were no. Uh, in fact, in, in my town, there was nobody who filed for town council. So there was literally no reason for me to go vote. I just did it because I do it. Um, a lot of people probably do. Um, you know, I was talking to Governor Whitman uh, the other night at a WNET event, and she was saying open primaries and um, ranked choice voting are maybe two ways that we could kind of try to revitalize our primaries. Uh, So those might be some things to look at, though I'm not sure that the parties would be terribly happy with open primaries. But um, clearly when you've got like only a half million people out of, you know, more than like like six and a half million who are registered going out to vote, there's a problem. Thanks. And our our fifth panelist is uh, Joey Fox, who... uh, work writes for about politics for the New Jersey Globe and previously was the editor of the Williams Record, the student newspaper of Williams College. Welcome, Joey. Thank you. My resume is not very long yet, so I kind of have to, to <laughs> dig back into college immediately. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'm batting clean up here, so I'll, I'll do my best to sort of to wrap some various points from the other four panelists together. Um, I mean, I think that Colleen is 100% right in that this primary, like most New Jersey primaries, the winner was the county line. Um, I assume that everybody on this type of political junkie panel and watching this knows what the county line is. But just in case you don't, it's a system that allows the county political parties, both Democrat and Republican, to select their preferred candidates and then have all of those candidates appear together on the ballot as one big unified slate. And it has both like literal impacts in the sense that when people are voting on their ballots, candidates who are aligned in the, the party slate or the, like the dominant looking slate are very much, they just look like the candidates to vote for. And it also has sort of subtle impacts of candidates who have the party line 
um, will oftentimes discourage other candidates from even contesting the election to begin with and will scare away fundraising from potential other candidates. One thing I think is interesting, since we've mentioned a lot of uncontested races, Assemblywoman Jaffer and Senator Oraho, both of you are retiring, your seats, um, the 16th Legislative District Assembly seat and the 24th Legislative District Senate seat, neither of them drew contested primaries, even though it's an open seat. Um, both had one Democrat and one Republican file. Um, so I think that that is pretty much always the story of New Jersey primaries. And last night was no exception. You really saw the county line, except for except for Gloucester, as Colleen mentioned, it was really dominant. <clears throat> and I think one primary where that was interestingly noticeable was in Senator Oroho's 24th district, where there was a contested assembly primary. You had in Sussex County, Sussex is one of the two counties that does not have a line. So that was a totally open primary. In the Morris County portion of the district, you had two candidates, Mike and Gannamore and Don Fantasia, who had the line. And in the Warren County part of the district, you had two other candidates, Jason Sarnowski and Josh uh, Akins have the line. And, you know, so this is kind of an interesting test study where you have three counties, four candidates, and three different ways of arranging the ballot. And pretty much exactly what you'd expect to happen happened. You had Warren vote for its preferred candidates, Morris voters vote for their preferred candidates, and then Sussex was pretty close, but ultimately they voted for Fantasia and Ganimort, and their support of them was what allowed them to win. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, I if you if you read the the New Jersey Globe, you'll know that I harp on on this kind of stuff a lot on on ballot lines, on uh, ballot design. That's another big thing. Part of the reason why you saw off the line wins in Gloucester County, in my opinion, is that <clears throat> even though there was a slate that had the technical county line, there were two full slates that were arranged on the ballot that looked like they might have the county line. And the one that was actually off the line was more prominent the way that the ballot was designed. And so a voter who wasn't paying super close attention to the primary genuinely probably would not know which was actually the party endorsed slate. And you saw that in the results, there was not a big boost for the county endorsed candidates the way that there were in other counties. Um, <clears throat> so it's not my place to, to offer solutions. I don't know if that is a problem in need of a solution necessarily, but when we're talking about, you know, how these primaries really work, you know, in other states, you might be talking about ideological differences. You might be talking about competing endorsements. You might be talking about all these kinds of things. In New Jersey, those things usually take a back seat. It really is these, these concrete party-based factors that are, are are dominant in primaries. And I think you very much saw that last night as you do in most primaries. Thank you. And don't hesitate to offer solutions. We're, we all need solutions. So, um, and I have one I want to put on the table in just a second, but I want to mention people who are watching this um, uh, live stream, you can submit questions if you want um, by going to the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And if you have a question, or comment, uh, make it short since it's hard to, for me to read them. Um, um, but the, the, I've always been impressed how in New Jersey, it's always election day. I mean, there's always an election coming and there's always a reason why people are in politics or thinking, well, maybe we should just wait till next November when the situation might change in one way or another. And in Maryland, um, uh, everybody's elected at the same time. So the governor and the entire legislature, both houses, are elected to a four-year term on the same day. And they're stuck with each other. And you know, there's no thinking of, well, let's wait. Maybe we'll get a different committee chair next year. Um, and there are, I don't know if their turnout's higher or not, but it would bolster my argument if it is. Um, but the there's, it's more a time to focus on the legislature and what it does and who's in it. And then you can sit back for four years and watch what they do. And I don't know if, uh, if it's something like that. I think it could be helpful in New Jersey. Who knows how you make that happen? But I welcome anyone's thoughts on that or, or other reforms or changes that might make the system better. Oh, you know, John, I, I think I, I think with the um, interesting thing with the every, every four years, where here you have. The Senate, who runs on a 10-year cycle, 4-4-2, a little bit off cycle because of the, the pandemic on this one, but the Assembly runs every two years, um, and obviously the governor runs every every, every four years. But I, I do think that that, you know, even, even though I would hate to think that if we waited every four years, what our 
participation rate would be then, you know. And it's interesting. I know Joey mentioned that Sussex was only one of two counties. I think the other one, Salem County, I believe, that doesn't have a that doesn't have a county line. And quite frankly, I get asked many times, you know, how come I wasn't pushing for a county line and whatnot. And I said, listen, I I I, I quote unquote ran against the establishment when I first ran for for election, both as a freeholder when they called them freeholders, now they're called commissioners, and when I ran for uh, uh, the Senate. Uh, so interesting enough, I said, when I quote unquote became, as people said, you know, I've been, I've been in the elected office now for 22 years, but 16, this is my 16th year in, in, in the Senate. Uh, so some people say I became the establishment. So it was kind of like, why didn't I want a county line? I said, well, you know, I, I didn't like it when I first won. So I, did, I, 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 I personally, I didn't like it. Now I'm not on the county committee. So that would be something that'd be up to the county committee. Uh, to uh, decide to do. But I, I do think having the way we have in New Jersey, where at least every two years we have some sort of election, I think is probably a pretty good thing. You know, I, I was going to say that we have established our elections such that we we have our state elections off the federal cycle, which is different from other um, states. We always have more folks come out and vote for the fe- in the federal elections. And granted, the president is a big deal. Um, and Congress theoretically is, although I think we could all agree that they don't get an awful lot done now these days unless they absolutely have to because of all of the partisanship. Um, I do think it's a it's a good idea to, to separate, and that was the idea, right, to separate what's happening at the state level from the federal level so they don't get, you know, so you're not voting for your state representatives based on who the presidential candidate is. And, and I think that's a good thing. But um, I do think we have to figure out a way to just generate more interest. I I constantly argue that um, I think what the state legislature does and what the governor does really has a lot more impact on our day-to-day lives than what happens in Congress, right? I mean, you know, property taxes and, you know, local laws, uh, just like there's there are arguments now about uh, bail reform. And there's just so much happening at the state level that I really wish people would pay attention to and and learn about the issues and go out to vote for. But I, I, I mean, I just don't know how to get people interested. I have, I have a few thoughts. Yes, yeah, please. Um, I think, you know, my basic message would be that voting should be simple because people have so many things going on in their lives the average person cannot dedicate hours and hours and, you know, every single year researching tens of candidates. It's it's a lot for people. And so, you know, I do understand the, the desire to decouple and that's why we have some elections that are local elections that are totally on different, you know, election days than even our state elections. I think that an effort to have elections happen at the same time would be great. Like, I think if we were not off cycle, we would probably get a lot more people voting in state elections and maybe even knowing who their state legislators are because they can make that time. Um, It's also a reason why I don't think that ranked choice voting is the solution because I think that it complicates matters and it confuses people. A lot of people wouldn't even rank beyond the first one. And then if the round goes beyond the first one, then their vote might not be counted and things get complicated because there's an algorithm. And what if one person wins the absolute votes, but then ends up not winning the election? Again, that would, is a confusing outcome that throws up you know, the validity of the whole election to question for a lot of people. Because again, people don't have time to research a million things about every candidate. And I, and I think, you know, there was a, there's a very interesting question in the Q&A about, you know, in other parts of the country, we see maybe more extremism um, in elected officials or in candidates than we do in New Jersey. And I do think that parties have a moderating effect on, can, on like the extremism that could emerge. Um, and I think that there is a place for people knowing who the vetted candidates are through the party. But Again, we have to balance that out with it not being impossible for someone who doesn't have that to get recognition or to win. So that would just be you know, something that I think about a lot. How can we simplify the process? How can we make it so that people who have a million worries in their lives and are just working hard to get to the next day can understand, can take the time, and that it's not an extra burden on them to participate and to exercise their rights to vote? 
That gets to one of the other questions that, uh, that uh, in the chat about how do you get information about local local races in particular in politics in New Jersey? And um, three of you are certainly part of the answer in terms of, and I don't know what your thoughts are in terms of the challenges of collecting that information and, and getting and finding an audience that, or having the audience that would be interested in reading it find the monitor of the globe spotlight. Mm -hmm several others that are out there. Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah. It, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was, sorry, I was gonna say, yeah, I mean, there, there's a huge problem with a lack of, of local news these days. Um, you know, we've, we've lost so many publications. Um, the ones that are operating are a lot of them, like the patches and some others are, are one man shops or one woman shops. So they just, folks don't have the time to do it. I mean, I can tell you at Spotlight this year, um, you know, there was a decision made that we, we put up all of our normal information, but we wound up really not doing any race, any stories on any individual races, which we've done in the past, just because we didn't have the manpower to do it. Um, and that's, un that's totally unfortunate. I'm, uh, maybe if, you know, as we talk about what the assemblywoman said, if we had a ballot where we could, when the sample ballot goes out, every candidate could also have just a, a brief bio or, you know, these are my three top issues. At least there's some information getting there that would help a voter make decisions. I, I don't know. Hi, I, I just want to quickly, I, I live briefly in Washington state and there in your elections, you get a booklet that has a paragraph about each candidate. And I think something that would give a like versus like comparison to voters would be so helpful because if you're getting different mailers, you're seeing different television ads, you're seeing all different things, it's very hard to compare like with like in that context. So absolutely anything that we could do to, to invest in that voter education, but certainly local news and state news is, is so important. And sometimes I wonder if you know a nonprofit model would be more viable. Um, just throwing that out there, not being an expert in media, but really truly valuing the work that local and state media does and knowing that not having that is really, really tough for communities. Thankfully, in Montgomery Township, where I live, we have a strong local paper that you know, gives very in-depth reporting. Um, and it's, it's a great way for people to get to know what's happening. Um, so just throwing a couple of things out there. Actually, uh, and, and in, in our, uh, up here in Chester's County, we did have there's a couple of uh, free weekly newspapers that actually get mailed or you can obviously get them online um, as well. And they did a pretty good job of putting together, um, you know, the candidates, just as the assemblywoman said here, the three particular issues. Um, the New Jersey Herald, which used to be a, um, one of the more, uh, you know, cover local stuff, it really didn't cover, uh, doesn't cover much local anymore, except they did do, uh, I know one of their reporters, Kyle uh, Morrell did a uh, thing on the, um, I believe, on the uh, commissioner races as well as on the on the assembly races. And interesting enough, the you know some of the debates. I think Joey, you were part of one of the debates. Uh, I think you helped moderate one of the debates for the uh, assembly race. And then a local um, uh, radio station WRNJ, uh, Joyce Hesley's did it as well. So I I, I think they were pretty, uh, and obviously because they had very much contested races. I think they did a you know a pretty good job of of getting out those uh, getting out those issues. Now, obviously, getting out to you know all the voters. Well, we had you know a 22 percent participating on the Republican side. Obviously, unfortunately, a lot of people that you know just as we all know don't participate in 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 the primaries and wait until the general election thing. Then that's the most important one. Now, let's face it, every election is important. You know. Yeah, I mean, can I just jump in here? Uh, obviously, like the news media in New Jersey and elsewhere, is the the the, the, the staff has the staffs of these papers have been decimated. Um, but there's still a lot of available news about politics and and government in New Jersey that people can get if they really and they don't even have to search super hard for it. I think one of the issues is, like I said before, there are so few contested races where I live. I mean, I, you know, the, what's there to learn? You know, the Democrat was running by herself and in the assembly races, the Republicans were running unopposed and the Democrats were running unopposed. What do I have to learn about that? What do I have to read about that race? Nothing, because there's nothing they can do to get my vote. Um, 
And um, even in some of the other races, like if I lived in the third district, I just I followed that race between Senator Ed Durrett and Assemblyman Beth Sawyer. I don't know that either of them made a super compelling case why one would be better than the other. They're both sort of like conservative Republicans who would probably vote the same way on everything. And so if I were a voter there, I'd probably think, well, what's what's really the point here when I get to the when I go in November to vote when it's important? I'll vote for the Republican. But right now, why bother? Because I, I'm just voting for, I'm choosing between two very similar people. Someone? Yeah, I was going to say that I think that this uh, issue goes beyond people not knowing about the candidates enough or not knowing about the elections. A lot of people just don't know what the state legislature does. They don't know how many districts they are. They don't know what district they're in. Um, and so I think they don't know what issues are at stake. They don't know what's what work's been done in the legislature or what you know the controversial issues are. So you know when I ran last time, I had a contested primary. I also had a contested general. I participated in debates, but very few people watched those debates. Um, even though the League of Women Voters and our local newspaper you know put them together, I'm so thankful for the League of Women Voters for Vote for One One, the website that they have that you know candidates can submit information. But I think it's it's a bigger issue than just people don't know about the elections or the candidates. They don't know or they're not aware of the significance of state government rich, writ large or what's happening or who their um, representatives are. And they don't feel a sense of ownership. Uh, that's something that I really try to get across to people that you can make a difference. Uh, sometimes I think it's there's this overwhelming cynicism because of so much, so much bad news about politics. And, and sometimes it's deserved. But if all people hear is just constant negativity, they check out um, because they don't hear about anything good happening and they think nothing good can ever happen. So I, I think it goes beyond just not knowing about the elections. Maybe instead of teaching New Jersey. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Colleen. Go ahead. Oh. I was going to say maybe instead of teaching New Jersey in fourth grade, we teach it in. 11th grade in school. I mean, I remember uh, one of the things that my sons did, they made a cake. We had to bake, parents baked like 21 cakes and then they cut a, each county from it. And that was a big deal. But I don't know how much then they brought from that fourth grade into knowing like what New Jersey government is. I think we just recently were voting on bringing civics back into the, uh, the idea of teaching civics back into the schools. I, and I, couldn't agree more with Colleen, the assemblywoman. And I think some of the most important things we do, and interesting, Colleen, thinking about, hey, do it in the fourth grade, right? And some of the most interesting things we do is when we go to talk, and I love doing this, going to talk, and wh wherever I get invited, I go. And talk to the fourth grade, whatever grade it happens to be, about, you know, we've got all these great things about how a bill becomes a law, you know, the, the, the regulatory stuff, you know, who can be a senator, who can be an assembly person, you know, 40 districts, you know, two assembly districts. You got all these great statistics, and then you got, you know, you can intersperse that with, you know, what's the state dinosaur, what's the state fish, what's the state, you know, something important thing, but also bring that up maybe, hey, let's have a refresher in, in you know, eighth, ninth, tenth grade or something like that as they get closer to eight, being 18. Um, I think that's probably, a, you know, a pretty good idea. I used to joke with a lot of people when they would say um, about, you know, uh, being a state senator. And one of the questions I would always get is, what is we to do when you're in Washington? I said, well, I don't go to Washington. I go to, I, I go to Trenton. <laughs> so, Do we have a state dinosaur center? We do. We do. I do. Dinosaur we do. Yes. You're very good. <laughs> How sad that I know that. <laughs> I remember seeing that at the New Jersey State Museum. <laughs> right. Alan Rosenthal, the late political science professor and director of the Eagleton Institute, used to complain about all the efforts to get students to lobby for a state mollusk and a state tree and everything else, because he thought it it gave people a false impression about it. it made it seem that it was too easy to get legislative change. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, but but John, you bring up a good point because one of the things, and you know, and all you know that you know every. Uh, two-year session, right? Uh, if a bill doesn't get through, it, you got to start all over again, right? You'd be amazed if you look at, what is it, between six and, say, 8,000 bills that might get put in if you combine, you know, the, the, the two houses and how many men make it through the whole process, you know? And then 
the, uh, you know, then you're probably talking about somewhere between 400 to maybe 800, somewhere depending upon how busy it is, you know, down, during that, that session. But then you start all over again. You know, if, if it didn't get through, it, it, you know, it ends up starting all over again. And then when you talk about, hey, listen, you also have the executive branch with the regulatory side. And then people start thinking about, oh, wait a minute, I thought everything came through laws. Oh, no, no, no. It, no. So it, it just gives us something good to talk about. And the idea of talking about that at their level on, on the fourth, I'd be really surprised at how well they do in the fourth grade about talking about things. And I think they probably need a refresher as they get older. <laughs> You know, a, a summary comment about New Jersey state government, and I'm sure in other places too, is that it's really just three people who make the laws. It's the Senate president, the assembly speaker, and the governor. And I wonder for um, the two of you as individual legislators, particularly Senator Oro, who's been there a while, what you felt you've been able to accomplish in the legislature, beyond constituent service, but in, in influencing legislation as a member of the minority for all these years. Well, John, thank you. For, and quite frankly, and I'm glad you bring up constituent service because the one thing I try to teach as well is that everybody thinks that it's the laws or everything to get done. But quite frankly, when that phone rings, you get an email, you get something, some sort of communication from a constituent. That's the most really important thing that we do. We, you know, uh, you know, some somebody needs somebody needs some help. Uh, particularly, I'm, I'm sure the assembly women with you know the uh, the unemployment situation, motor vehicle situation, all our offices were were inundated with with a lot of questions of people who just needed uh, needed help, and that's something that happens you know all the time. But being in a minority, the one thing that I always look to have, and, it, and it's interesting because you look at some of the relationships of us down Republican Democrat. There's a lot of good close relationships a, across the aisle, and when I started my comments earlier about the importance about being a majority, I mean, obviously the majority controls the, um, as you said, the, you know, the, the Senate president, the speaker and the governor, are the ones that, you know, end up, you know, the president, the Senate president and the speaker control the agenda for the each respective house. You got the committee members who are the uh, committee chair people who are the um, majority party, but being in the minority, the one thing I always tried to look for is, somebody in the majority party who had the same kind of issue that I had for my district and try to partner with them. And, and we would, and quite frankly, many times that that was, you know, ended up being, you know, uh, pretty successful, but that's, that's hey listen, let's say the majority gets to control a lot of things. So you got to try and find somebody who's has very similar issues uh, in their district and see if you can partner, you know, with them. And then the other thing is, as and the assemblywoman being in the majority, I'm sure it's uh, it's a lot better to be in the majority than it happens to be in the minority. That's for sure. Are you gonna say something, assemblywoman, about your experience with that? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, when I started my time in government, I, I was the only Democrat on a five person township committee. So I did get a taste of that. Um, and I know what it, what it feels like to be in the minority, but, you know, work together. And, you know, as you'll hear from most legislators and elected officials, the vast majority of things we work on together. And, you know, there is agreement on doing X, Y, Z because it just serves the best interest of the public. Um, but, you know, there are certain things that it's a lot harder to get done if you're in the minority and it's easier to get done if you're in the majority. Um, I think I, once another thing I will say is having served in government for the years that I have, I think it's very, very important to have a loyal opposition and because we keep each other honest, you know, it is important to have different viewpoints um, and you'll find points of commonality and points of difference within your party across party uh, lines. So you know, these are all great, great elements of our of our system. Um, I would say, you know, some of the, the priorities that I came into the legislature with that I've worked on that have been really important to me have to do with women's reproductive rights, maternal health, um, you know, mental health resources for children in schools, in the higher education system, getting uh, state resources to combat teen suicide, to invest in emergency services in my district in Huntington County and Somerset County. Um, and, you know, this is, again, government is there to serve the public. 
there will be certain issues that we disagree on either within a party or across party lines. But for the most part, I think that the public should rest assured that there are a lot of people working very hard to ensure that things get better in New Jersey. And I think that they are headed in that direction. I think that one thing that people, the members of the public don't always realize is, is just how many bills pass on unanimous or near unanimous votes in any given legislative session. Like, I mean, and that's partially on us in the press because we don't really write about those bills very much. Um, They don't have the same kind of, you know, like notability power as a really contentious bill on abortion or, or gun laws or something like that. But, you know, just the number of times when I'm sitting in the assembly chambers or the Senate chambers and like 10 bills in a row come up about making minor edits to the veterans healthcare system or making the state juice, cranberry juice or what, like, I mean, whatever, these are all, these are all <clears throat> smaller bills usually than the ones that you really hear a lot about, but <clears throat> the number of votes that are 79 to zero on judge confirmations on all these things it's <clears throat> it's noticeable i mean it's really like that is the majority of the actual actions that the legislature takes in any given year that's, that's a very good point joey and i was going to th- th- think about the same thing before because you know it's interesting because as as technology changes and as things change you know laws you know obviously you have to change or regulations have to change as well and some of those you know, unanimous uh, bills that go up are recognition of the fact that, hey, th- things, you know, things do change. And um, I- interesting enough, when I was first got into the legislature, there was actually a law, actually a law on the books that said that a school district and a municipality, if they were not contiguous, could not share services. So why would we have, why would we have such a law like that? So what we did, obviously, on a, on a bipartisan basis and it probably was unanimous we had to we had to change that law uh because obviously with technology and and the uh, um focus on shared services which i completely completely agree with um hey, we should try and foster as many shared services as uh, you know as as possible but there was actually a law in the books pro- prohibiting if you weren't contiguous i'm going to move a little bit to talk about the the, fu- the short-term future of coming out of yesterday and going into the November election and beyond that, the legislative session and politics in New Jersey between for the rest of 2023 and into 2024 and the remainder of the governor's term. What do you, any of you see happening or you think should be happening in terms of issues to focus on or possible poss- openings to do something good or make a change? Subway. I, Does anybody? I mean, I do go, go ahead, ahead. Senator. Who, 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 who's that, Colleen? Go ahead. Yep, go ahead, Senator. No, no, no. I went first before you go now. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I think a few things which I said before. Obviously, the, the, the budget is going to be, uh, it has to be, you know, before um, July 1st. Um, so obviously, we're gonna, that's going to be the uh, most near term right, right now. But then as you get into the November election, you're going to have, you know, some of the issues, obviously, that we talked about before of the affordability have a lot of you know, talk right now about who's who's got the best uh, property tax relief plan that, you know, that there is. We all know that property taxes is a is a major, major issue and how school funding, you know, obviously flows into, you know, that property tax uh, issue. We've got a lot of cash in New Jersey. Uh, been there for, you know, uh, the ideas of how we could actually, you know, be, whether it be from the fund balance or whether it be from the uh, uh, pandemic relief uh, money that still uh, has not been spent or from the uh, debt defeasance and avoidance funds that have been, you know, put into, uh, you know, different uh, fund classifications within the state budget. You add all those together, that cash right there is about $14 billion. So the whole idea of how you have a plan that is sustainable and not creating new kinds of plans. So I think that's going to be it. The energy master plan has had a lot of, of discussion about it. There's, we've been critical of the fact that there's been no real cost estimates. Um, we're, we're all for having a practical, you know, uh, energy master plan. We all, you know, uh, I put out a, a bill about the fact that, Hey, listen, we need all sorts of kinds of energy. Uh, but at the same time, we can't put all our eggs. We see it all the time. You can't put all your eggs in one basket. I do financial planning for a living. You hear that all the time. Same thing with energy. You can't put all your eggs in, 
in one basket. And then, as I said before, the school funding will always be a significant issue for us, us to talk about. And I think those are probably going to be the issues between now and and, um, and and November for the general election. All right. Yeah, I was just going to ask if anyone else here thought that stay New Jersey or stay NJ, the <clears throat> Democrats' property tax relief program to give seniors of every income at least $10,000, depending on how much pay, <clears throat> back in property taxes. Does anybody else think that that might be election related this year i mean you, you know you talk about the um you, you talk about the loyal opposition the republicans have put forth their own plan and suddenly you know we get what a couple of weeks ago this plan from uh, assembly speaker craig coughlin that we want to help um all seniors doesn't matter you could make you know you could have three million in income and you're going to get a break on your property taxes and just so happens, I think that senior citizens do a lot of voting. I, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just being cynical here. But I think that's going to be a big point of contention. Yeah, prop, property taxes will always be, a big, a, obviously, in New Jersey, a big point of contention. Um, you know, and until we actually address the real cost drivers there um, with, uh, with respect to, you know, the idea of the shared services, the idea of, um, you know, being more efficient at all levels of government is, is critical. We put together a plan that say, hey, we got four four point three billion dollars of money sitting cash sitting in a debt defeasance and avoidance fund. Every municipality or county or something like that either has debt already on their books or is looking at projects that are uh, debt financing um, eligible. Why can't we get that money out right away? That right away would help you know, ease the burden on local municipalities and, and, and counties. And obviously that would help, um, you know, local property taxpayers. So, you know, listen, the idea of having these discussions about local property tax uh, issues, it, to me, is, is a good thing. Let's make sure that it's something, we had this issue in the energy tax receipts last year, 75 million in, in this current year budget that went back to municipalities. We were critical of the fact that, it's in for one year, but there's no permanent going forward. And what happened, the governor took it out of this year's budget, which we said was absolutely going to happen. Now, if you look at it on a bipartisan basis, Republicans and Democrats have said, hey, listen, that's good property tax relief. We can get that money back, you know, to the municipalities right away. So I, 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 obviously that's going to be a major issue. Um, and having it as in the forefront of discussion, I think is, is, is a good thing. Uh, I think that, you know, for me, we need to keep in mind uh, inequality in our state, that we have almost a million people in our state who live under the poverty line. What are we doing to address that? What are the investments that we're making in services that people use throughout our state? For example, our public transportation system. Uh, what are the investments that are being made in higher education? Um, what are the investments that are being made in our K-12 education system? So, you know, I'm definitely glad to see those investments in the proposed budget um, and, you know, keeping in mind that about 64% of our population lives in owner-occupied residences. And so we do need to consider the needs of renters in the state of New Jersey as well. Um, and what are we doing for young people in the state of New Jersey? Those are, those are the things that are top of mind for me. Um, our, our hour has gone by really quickly. I want to ask one of the questions that's in the chat is very specific of who won the Middlesex County Commissioner's race. Does anyone know that? This is Leslie Koppel and Charles Tamaro, who are the, the two incumbent commissioners. They won by a pretty big margin. And the record will show it was the, right, it was, it was the globe that knew the answer to that. Um, well, I'm going to ask uh, if the three journalists would have any closing comments you'd like to give we wrap this up. No, I'm just sort of curious, you know, when Colleen brought up this this property tax um, uh, plan that if Democrats get it through, um, I'm sort of curious how Democrats who who fought for it are going to campaign on. I mean, I understand seniors vote, but there are people in their 
30s and 40s and 50s who vote who will not be eligible. So I'm sort of curious how they're going to campaign for, please vote for me. I gave your wealthy parents a tax break, but you can't get one because you're not old enough. Um, it may not be as big a winner as they think, but you know, what do I know? Yeah, I think that'll certainly be uh, an issue in the election. Uh, I'd like to see that going forward. Um, I also see that the Republicans are bringing up an awful lot of other issues, things like, as the senator said, the energy master plan. Um, you know, we keep hearing about hearing about the offshore wind and the whale deaths. Um, I'm sure we're going to hear about uh, more school related issues and, um, you know, book book banning. I know that some people don't like that term, but there's an awful lot happening in the culture wars. So I think it'll be an interesting November election. I mean, what, so one thing I'll quickly say is since we've already talked about turnout, you know, there, there were there were some election years, particularly during sort of the, the Trump presidency, that were very much exceptional election years, like 2018 and 2020 in particular, where, you know, turnout was very high. And, and, <clears throat> you know, just they, politics were not behaving as usual. I feel like this primary so far shows that 2023 is maybe politics kind of behaving as usual. Like this, I, I'm not sure if there's anything too exceptional going on. Turnout was not that high. Not many races were contested, or at least not more or less than usual, really. So so right now, 2023 is off to a fairly unexceptional start. But it'll be interesting to see as these next five months go on, whether, you know, as the 2024 presidential race goes on, as these other issues start to come up to prominence, who knows what will be the dominant issues of November, whether something about this year becomes exceptional in that kind of way. Whether the 2025 governor's race becomes more and more prominent is... I'm yeah, that is because we have a, the tiniest attention span ever, and we can't even focus on the current election. We have to always be focusing on the next one and the one after that. Um, well, 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 thank you all. I guess um, the, the, I've been running, leading these programs uh, before, after almost every New Jersey statewide primary and general election since, as I mentioned, since the year 2000. And I'm retiring from the Eagleton Institute this month. So I. Hope others at Eagleton will carry on this if it's a tradition or service or whatever it is. Election day is November 7th, I believe. So uh, come to this space November 8th and see what's here. But thank you all very much. And I hope everybody has a good summer and uh, apparently stays inside today and doesn't breathe. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, all. you everybody. And good luck, John. Good luck. Yes. We're, yeah, miss we're not you, going John. away, but thank you. Yeah.